The paper that I'm, I'm uh, presenting today is called The Real Effects of Capital Controls, Credit Constraints, Exporters, and Firm Investment. Um, and the pun is intended in the title, which um, very few people get, but the paper is about Brazil. Uh, my co-authors are Laura Alfaro at Harvard Business School and Fabio Canchuk, who's at the University of Sao, uh, Sao Paulo. So, um, the motivation for this paper really arises from the fact that there has been a swing in the academic pendulum uh, and in the policy pendulum in terms of advocating um, capital control. So, uh, for example, the IMF, um, you know, quite recently has shifted its view on the fact that while macroeconomic uh, policy adjustment is clearly warranted, proper financial supervision and regulation, etc. They've also sort of reopened the door towards um, allowing for capital flow measures, uh, not as a substitute for macroeconomic policies uh, to adjust underlying distortions, but as a way to uh, address capital flows that might be disruptive uh, to emerging economies. In particular, the debate has sort of taken center stage in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, where all of a sudden, in uh, light of sort of the expansive monetary uh, policies like QE in the United States, there were these huge capital flows to emerging markets, and a number of central bank governors started to worry about the disruptive impact of these flows on their economies. The, um, and so you can see this quote from the central bank governor of Taiwan, um, and there are a number of other central bank governors um, and uh, finance ministers from Brazil, India, etc., who've sort of talked about the fact that the U.S. printed a lot of money, so there's a lot of hot money flowing around. We see hot money in Taiwan and elsewhere in Asia. These short-term capital flows are disturbing emerging economies. So what is the uh, rationale for um, people being concerned about these uh, spillovers of monetary policy in the developed world on the emerging world? The first one is obviously macroprudential, uh, which is designed to mitigate the volatility of capital flows. So while the benefits of international financial liberalization may, may be many, such as reducing the cost of capital, increase in investment, um, a positively impacting growth, offering uh, diversification opportunities for international investors. Uh, the danger is that if these flows are volatile, subject to sudden reversals or sudden stops, they can have a destabilizing impact on, uh, on the recipient economies. So the macroprudential con concern is to advocate for some sort of counter-cyclical capital flow measures that are going to mitigate the amplitude of the capital flow driven booms and busts which end up um, leading to high uh, levels of leverage particularly when it comes to foreign debt and the idea is that if you, if you um, apply capital controls in a counter-cyclical way this will moderate those capital inflow booms and busts um, and if there is a slowdown or reversal or sudden stop, that will have a less adverse impact on the recipient economies. But underlying these, uh, the rationale for capital controls is also a sort of an implicit protectionism where a number of governors uh, of central banks have argued for the fact that capital control, huge amounts of capital inflows can lead to currency appreciation, which has a negative impact on the competitiveness of the export sectors in these countries. So sort of preventing currency appreciation is another sort of rationale for why countries have started advocating for capital controls. 
Now, as far as the existing literature is concerned, an extensive ex empirical literature has sort of focused on the aggregate effects of capital controls, uh, such as on interest rates or exchange rates, et cetera. But what we argue from this in this paper is that these macroeconomic studies don't shed light on the channels through which the imposition of controls can affect, for example, firms in um, the economy. So really, we want to take a sort of a micro level lens to this issue of what happens when you impose capital controls. And what we found when we looked through the uh, existing literature on the micro effects of capital controls, uh, the studies were relatively scarce. And other than Kristen Forbes, who's written a couple of papers on this, uh, we didn't find very much. And um, data availability uh, at the firm level is obviously a constraint um, in, in, in emerging economies in particular. So what we do in this paper is actually to look at uh, firm level data from Brazil uh, to evaluate the effects of capital controls on the firms in, um, in, in the economy. And in particular, what we're going to focus on is stock returns as a measure of um, the uh, news effect or the impact on the change in the present discounted value of expected future cash flows when these uh, announcements are made of the imposition of capital control measures and also at the firm level look at the impact of capital controls on firm level investment. And Brazil has really been the poster child for the a country which has systematically imposed a number of capital control measures. They started doing it right before, in 2008, before the financial crisis hit, and they eased off on it after the financial crisis hit. But the Brazilian economy recovered relatively quickly after the financial crisis, and very quickly they started sort of imposing uh, these measures ag once again. And I'll sort of show you very briefly the extent to which these capital control measures have been applied in Brazil. The other reason is because we want to look at the stock market lens of what happens when capital control announcements are made, uh, the stock market in Brazil is relatively well developed. Uh, the traded uh, value of traded stocks is over six, uh, 40 percent, and um, and 65 percent of um, the percent of market cap as a percent of GDP is about 65 percent. The other sort of advantage that we have is not only do we have the standard sort of data stream, world scope type data on the firm level characteristics, we also have data from the CSACs, which is the export. Um, uh, sort of institution of Brazil. So we have a lot of firm level exporting uh, data. Um, and what this allows us to do is to use an event study methodology to study the impact of capital control announcements using these stock prices as well as other firm level data. So just a brief snapshot of what happened in Brazil. So like I said, they started off in March of 2008 um, applying this IOF tax, which uh, just from a sort of an institution's perspective, uh, the finance minister can just sort of announce these without uh, ratification from Congress. So it's not something that has to go through a long ratification process. This can just be announced by policy decree almost overnight. So that sort of makes for a nice announcement. Uh, you know, if you're doing a study on announcement effects, it's sort of a nice setting. Um, and then what we see is after the financial crisis hit in October of 2008, they sort of reduced the taxes. And then a year later, these sort of we see this consistent measures of capital controls on equities, fixed incomes, ADRs, uh, derivatives, uh, overseas loans and bonds uh, with maturities of different um, time periods, etc. And sort of, you know, there was a sort of systematic approach to applying these uh, controls uh, for a wide variety of financial instruments. So the general predictions of theory are that if we're going to start from a benchmark of globalized financial markets, what theory suggests is that once you sort of impose capital control measures, which are a move towards financial autarky once again, Theory suggests that if successful capital controls can drive up the cost of capital, and that these credit constraints are at the firm level are more likely to bind for firms 
that are more dependent on external finance. This is particularly true if production and exporting are associated with fixed costs um, and the firms are dependent on external finance, these credit constraints at the firm level become uh, more relevant. So um, if you sort of think about this from the perspective of Rajan and Zingales, uh, if you want to think about the um, sort of the opposing sort of, if firms with easier access to external finance or greater access to low cost of uh, funds might be able to overcome the barriers associated with these fixed costs. So this external finance dependence is really, their measure it relies on an industry level uh, measure which is based on initial project size, gestation lags, the need for continuing investment, ca ca uh, cash harvest periods, etc. Uh, but what this suggests is there might be heterogeneity not just across industries but also at the firm level. Uh, finally, if we think about the general predictions, as you saw in the case of Brazil, they kept imposing these measures, they kept increasing them, they kept taking them away, they kept putting them on one instrument, then taking it away and putting it on another instrument. Um, the argument that we also make is that these frequent policy changes can sort of lead to a, a, a great deal of policy uncertainty, which can sort of make, um, make it difficult for firms to plan their investment um, and have a negative impact on investment. So this debate about policy uncertainty and its effects on investment is sort of, you know, it's been going on in the US for a couple of years, but we also argue that in an emerging market environment, these frequent policy changes can have an adverse effect. I'm gonna give you a brief preview of the results. What we find is that there is a significant um, negative announcement effects. So there's a significant decline in cumulative abnormal returns which capture this news effect following these capital control announcements. The other interesting thing is that because these measures were announced on both debt and equity measures, we decided to sort of look at the debt controls, the controls that were put on debt um, and distinguish them from equity. And what we find interestingly is that the controls on debt flows are, are, are associated with less negative returns. So we have some theories about why this might be, but I would really welcome suggestions as to why the market sees controls on debt flows as different than um, uh, controls on equity. In terms of firm level characteristics, uh, this sort of just shows us that micro heterogeneity matters the large firms and the exporting firms who have, you know, it, in, in theory, they, they, they probably have easier access to external finance or exporting firms may have foreign currency proceeds, et cetera, and are less credit constrained. These firms are less affected by the controls and the largest exporting firms are, are certainly um, not affected very much. What we also find is that firms that are de more dependent on external finance are more adversely affected by the capital control announcements. Um, and finally, investment declines significantly for small non-exporting firms that are dependent on external finance. So, you know, if, if, we, if, if we say that capital control measures are effective, this might not be effective in the desired uh, direction in the sense that at the micro level, the heterogeneity suggests that who you're going to end up squeezing is basically the small firms, the non-exporting firms, the firms that are, are dependent on external finance, whereas the bigger firms, the exporting firms, are, are going to be uh, somewhat okay. Uh, so a, a roadmap, I'm just going to, I don't think I have too much time, so I'm just going to very briefly go over the theoretical underpinnings, which is just based on sort of a capital asset pricing model and what happens to um, expected returns or required rates of return when we go from uh, a state of full financial uh, integration towards mo moving towards financial autarky. Um, and then I'll present the results, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the event study methodology, the data results, and conclude. So here, if we think about the cost of capital from a firm level perspective, another way to look at the cost of capital is the required rate of return that investors um, will, will, will need in order to invest in a particular country, uh, in, a, in a particular firm. So changes in expected returns will depend on changes in firm-specific systematic risk 
Um, and these changes in the cost of capital or expected returns, if you think about stock prices as the present discounted value of expected future cash flows, by affecting the discount rates, that's going to affect stock prices. And if there's an effect on expected future cash flows, that's also going to affect stock prices. Uh, so it's the numerator is the cash flows, the denominator is the required rate of return, and all else equal, stock prices will fall if the market imputes an increase in expected returns or an increase in the cost of capital um, or a decrease in the expected future cash flows. So stock prices will go down if either the numerator falls or the denominator rises, um, and that's what we're going to try and sort of test a little bit. So complete financial integration in a CAPM sort of setting just implies that the required rate of return is going to be pinned down by the risk-free rate and the beta of a firm with the world market and the world market premium. So the systematic risk factor really depends on beta, which is the correlation of a particular firm's returns with the world market. Um, and if we sort of all of a sudden, starting with this financially integrated benchmark, if we move towards uh, capital controls that segment a country's stock market from the rest of the world, um, if we also make this sort of simplifying assumption just for the sake of analytics that we hold expected future cash flows constant for now, um, market segmentation will reduce the diversification uh, opportunities for, uh, for foreign investors, and these, these effects can be magnified if domestic investors are also in limited in their ability to invest abroad, as the pool of investors that are going to be able to uh, invest in an economy falls in the stock market, the relevant pool of uh, investors will tilt towards domestic, and for any given uh, stock, the expected rate of return now gets pinned down by the domestic risk-free rate and the beta of a firm's return with the world market and the local market risk premium. Admittedly, this is sort of extreme cases, but they're just designed to kind of illustrate an analytical point that this is sort of the case of full integration, this is the case of full segmentation, and um, you could have controls moving you along that spectrum from full integration towards autarky, depending on the strength of the controls. Um, so, what we what the other sort of thing that I want to point out is that if some firms, um, such as exporters, if the capital controls are successful in preventing currency appreciation, if some firms benefit from protect, uh, protectionism, expected cash flows could increase more than the required rate of return, such that stock prices rise. So we're sort of agnostic about how these controls are going to affect firms at the micro level. There might be some firms that actually benefit from having these controls in place. So the event study methodology is pretty standard in finance. If we just assume that markets are semi-strong form efficient in, in, with respect to public information, stock prices will adjust quickly, and so you can capture an announcement effect uh, when these uh, capital control policy measures are announced. We look at a very narrow window because you're always subject to this criticism that other things could have been going on. Um, so we look at a very narrow, stringent test of a two-day window uh, in order to avoid these concerns or mitigate concerns about cons uh, confounding news events. The stock prices are from data stream and we have a standard methodology in terms of looking at the normal market model 20, uh, 280 days before leading up to 30 days preceding the event date. And we uh, use cumulative abnormal returns using uh, a Scholes-Williams betas, which correct for um, sort of the volatility or the noise in daily data. Uh, the data about firm characteristics are taken from WorldScope. Uh, we look at Bovespa, but we also looked at the Ibra index. Um, we look at quarterly data from uh, Q1 2006 to Q4 uh, 2012. We can proxy for the size of these firms using the log of assets as well as sales. Uh, we can proxy for the liquidity by looking at the short-term debt to total debt. Um, and you know all this is in real terms, um, et cetera. Uh, we also have this export level data from the Brazilian Secretary of External Trade. The export range in US dollars uh, includes firms exporting less than 1 million, between 1 million and 100 million, and greater than 100 million. The basic regression framework is very, uh, very sort of straightforward. Uh, we have 
uh, the, uh, the cumulative abnormal return on the left-hand side in response, and this is, you know, in response to the controls announcements, and we have a constant and a bunch of firm-level controls that uh, standard errors are clustered two ways um, to an account for any cross-firm, cross-time um, correlations. And then what we're able to do is to include firm-specific characteristics such as size, leverage, et cetera. So let me show you the basic results. So if you don't include any controls, we see this sort of negative small effect of about 0.5% uh, uh, on when these capital control announcements are made uh, using sort of a pooled event study methodology. However, when we control for the size of these firms, we find that the, the negative effect is highly significant. So it's about 3.39% over a two-day period, which is a pretty big drop when you think about stock returns. Um, and if you look at the log, log total assets, the effect on size is actually positive. So this sort of suggests that larger firms are less affected, uh, but the overall effect is is, is still negative. Then we went ahead and controlled for the export status, which is just a simple dummy, and once again, we see this negative constant which captures this average effect on cumulative abnormal returns, um, but once again, the, uh, the coefficients on size and the exporter dummy remain positive. Okay, so it's not undoing this negative effect, but saying that they're less affected by these controls. Then we went ahead and looked at this export, disaggregated export data, and once again we find the size effect is positive, the average effect is negative and very significant, so this is all significant at the 1% level, and then what we find is that exporters, the very large exporters, and the ones between 1 and 100 million are less affected by what you can see by these positive and significant coefficients. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, what the data also allow us to do is to distinguish between debt events and equity events. We see a sort of similar pattern of, 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 of results with highly uh, negative uh, cumulative abnormal returns. But what we found interesting, and I'd love to talk more about this, is the controls on debt flows in panel A show that these returns are less negative than the ones on equity particularly when we look at firms that have sort of short-term liquidity needs the sh and, and a lot of short-term debt, for these firms, the short-term debt ratio is also negative and significant, which is a negative 4.8% <coughs> decline. So what this suggests is that firms with higher levels of short-term de uh, debt are probably more dependent on sort of short-term external finance in terms of short-term debt or equity, and therefore the imposition of these controls on equity has an even more negative effect uh, on these firm returns. The interesting thing is that we, when we think about macroprudential policy, debt is a non-contingent claim and does not embody the risk-sharing aspects of equity. And what this shows, is, uh, it's sort of, it's interesting to us that the market imputes a less negative effect on controls on debt than it does on equity. We still haven't got our heads around what that's really telling us, but it's, it's sort of an interesting finding. Then we went ahead and looked at this external finance dependence to see if it uh, drives abnormal returns. Again, the, the average effect is negative and significant, ranging from minus 2.3% to negative 3.4%. And we tried a bunch of different dummies. So we tried a continuous measure. We tried a measure where we separated firms into external finance dependence that's greater than the mean or less than the mean. Uh, we also focused exclusively on manufacturing firms, et cetera, and these basic results remain robust that large firms and exporters are somewhat shielded, uh, where the firm size and export coefficients are positive and significant, even though the constant is negative and highly significant. And the interesting thing is that when we control for external finance dependence, the coefficient on the small exporter variable is negative and significant. Okay, so small exporting firms probably have greater external financing needs and we, s we see this negative effect. <coughs> 
We also went and looked at, at, at the effect on firm level investment, and I don't want to belabor this because you know there are a number of identification issues, but we just wanted to sort of look at broad strokes what happens to investment. And what we find once again is that if we look at all firms, uh, you know, the decline in investment, we did it uh, around two events, before the financial crisis hit and after the financial crisis hit. And if we look at before and after, um, I think this is the two-year uh, period after, we don't find much of an effect. We find a significant effect before the financial crisis and after, if we look at this October 2009 day, date. What we find interestingly is that if your assets are below mean, uh, so if we sort of look at the range of assets and we look at the firms whose asset size is below mean asset size, we see this dramatic decline in, in sort of investment. Of course, we cannot attribute causality just given this summary statistic nature of this exercise, but it is sort of striking that, you know, uh, for the smaller firms, investment declines from 8.9% before, um, before the announcement and to 1.7% after. Again, we looked at exporting firms uh, and non-exporting firms, and we sort of find that for the exporters, we have this effect. We also find that for small exporters, they're, they're more um, sort of negatively impacted. And if we look at this external finance, we see that dependence on external finance, regardless of whether you're above or below, uh, has a, a negative effect. We did a number of robustness checks, such as controlling for the existence of bank debt, operating revenue, uh, excluding the Lehman event, because everyone said that's like a really, really negative event and that could be driving your results. We looked at an invariant estimation window where we estimate all the benchmark returns before the first announcement takes place. We looked at tightening events, loosening events, whether the firm is an MNC, whether they have an ADR, whether they have foreign bond issuance. The main message is that there's this negative effect on uh, cumulative abnormal returns. Uh, a bunch of other, uh, other robustness checks, um, different measures for returns, different event windows, uh, firms on, al on, al on an alternative, Ibra stock exchange, the, the big IPO of OGX, et cetera. Um, nothing really seemed to sort of knock out this, this, this result. So just to conclude, what I'd like to say is that the evidence in this paper suggests that capital controls increase market uncertainty reduce the availability of external finance, and lower investment at the firm level, the implications for macro models, which is really what we're trying to push, is that the focus on aggregate variables to examine the optimality of capital controls and abstract from firm heterogeneity at the firm level, um, I, we really think that macro models should focus a lot more on, on sort of looking at what is the effect going to be on actual firms in the economy. In particular, the evidence suggests that capital controls disproportionately affect small non-exporting firms, especially those more dependent on external finance, and I'm not sure this is what governments intend when they put on these capital control measures. Thank you. I enjoyed uh, reading uh, the paper and uh, in the comments, I would like to start quickly with a quick overview. I think the presentation was very sharp, so I'll do it uh, fast. So the, the <coughs> purpose of this paper is to evaluate the effects of capital controls on firm level stock returns and the real investment using data from Brazil. And this is, of course, a topic of uh, great importance, not only for Brazil. Now, uh, there are two stages. The authors present first the case study, focusing on the window of two days uh, after the announcement of a policy change. And then they are looking at before and after investment picture, uh, focusing on the two uh, years around 2008 and 2009. So I think that the main results were stated uh, uh, clearly. And it seemed to be that large firms and uh, the largest exporting firms are relatively unaffected by controls. Exporting firms saw a statistical significant rise in their investment rates, but the opposite happens for small non-exporting firms and the like. So um, let me uh, turn to the comments. 
And I have several questions about the event study methodology used in the paper and the ability, if you wish, to identify clearly the link between capital controls and firms' performance. And I would say that these comments are generically related to practically most of the papers that are dealing with capital controls. It's very hard, really, to, to uh, control for all the factors that you wish to control. So it's not really related to this paper. It's really a generic issue that uh, uh, it's not easy to deal with. So let me start with the um, event strategy of two days. Uh, there is a chance uh, that there is overreaction to policy announcements. And it's very hard to control for this because uh, we don't know really how to control at this stage for all the other factors. And the uh, uh, second issue, what is the counterfactual? So we know that Brazil has been characterized by a lot of internal political uh, instability. And at the end, I have a generic list of maybe five dimensions of internal political instability. Now, the timing of the announcement of the capital controls is typically chosen as a reaction to something internally or externally or both. Now, so the question is, what would have happened in the absence of this announcement of capital controls? And the answer is, we really don't know without trying to control for all the seven factors maybe that you can think Five of them may be internal and two external. So this is really a, a generic issue that uh, applies to most papers, all, including this paper. And the same concern applies to the before and after investment picture. Now, uh, looking at the literature, one approach that I found interesting, that uh, I'm not sure to what degree this is the ultimate way of dealing with this, is a paper by Jing Rak, Noi, and Zhang, the Journal of Banking and Finance. And by chance, they focused also on Brazil. They focused on five changes in capital account regimes, 2008 to 2011, and they attempted to use the synthetic control method. And they attempted to construct the counterfactual, i.e., Brazil with no policy change for each, uh, each, each of these changes. And they found no, no evidence that any tightening of controls was effective in reducing the magnitude of capital inflows, but observed modest and short-lived success in preventing further decline in inflows when the capital controls were relaxed. And they uh, concluded that possibly it's related more to the signaling effect of uh, the uh, intention of the government. Now, this, uh, this result is consistent with my reading of other studies that look not only at Brazil, that capital controls frequently are biting for a while, maybe a month or two. And going back to your interesting observation that it matters if this is debt or equity, there are ways of arbitraging capital controls. Uh, one is reclassifying whatever that is debt into equities. The second is trade misinvoicing. And typically, it may take a, a month or three or uh, to, uh, to start arbitraging these capital controls. And if you believe that because of instability of internal policies and external, maybe capital controls will uh, uh, disappear. So then it's, it's really quite messy to argue that all that we see in the data is capital controls. I, I, I'm sure that capital controls is some of this. I don't know what magnitude. And again, this is not an issue of your paper. It's an issue of all the papers. And Maybe the synthetic control is useful, maybe not, but th it's an indication of the issue. And in this context, I would like to make uh, two quick uh, points. Uh, I'm less surprised about the difference between equity uh, and uh, debt because uh, the classification of FDI is fuzzy. And if there is a, a, a change in the relative uh, stance of policies towards FDI, say, or equity versus debt, a savvy accountant uh, within a, a month or three uh, will arbitrage it. But if there is a strong change for equity, maybe you are blocking uh, one a margin of arbitrage. And there, I let me make obvious points that you are focused on Brazil, but one should be careful. Capital controls on a country that is running current account surplus may have different uh, implications versus deficit. So here, the internal stance of policies in uh, Brazil is very important in trying to understand what's going on. And uh, the second is, you are right that debt is not contingent claim, but once that you are recognizing the possibility of default of the firm, 
So the, everything is more blurred. So even the, the dead versus, uh, especially in Latin America, you know, uh, in New Zealand, maybe you're not going to see the faults, but uh, in Latin America, uh, never say never. So I'm not sure if the, the discrimination between the two tools is as sharp as when, uh, what you said. Now, uh, I would like to close with a statement about all the deficiencies of Brazil. Let me uh, not go through this, but my point is, I fully agree with you that policy instability is of great importance. Now, my guess is that most of the policy instability of Brazil is the outcome of these factors. And the added virtue of capital controls, it added instability for sure, because you cannot uh, time and you cannot predict the depth. But a, a, a fair question for me is, if we believe that policy instability is biting, and I believe in this, let us say uh, control maybe in the big picture for the internal versus the external and the interaction. And then maybe there is a hope of telling us what's going on. But if you are looking at uh, the entire uh, stance of uh, uh, the political scenario of, in, of Brazil in the last five years, I think it's too easy to argue that capital controls is the villain. It may contribute uh, maybe 20%, maybe 5%. At any rate, I think that as long as you are not preventing entirely capital mobility, there are ways of arbitraging it within uh, three months. So this uh, led to the uh, uh, big questions that understanding the marginal impact of capital controls on the growth challenges of uh, countries matters a lot. And here, I still believe that it matters a lot to control for the current account position of a country. And this leads me back to the net saving p position versus the investment, which may be a key factor if you are trying to uh, look at the uh, broader picture. So I like uh, the paper in terms of uh, the agenda. I think it's an open agenda in the sense that it's easier to criticize such a paper. Uh, it may be harder to fix it. But uh, uh, presenting it in India, claiming that most of the problems of India are related to the lack or the presence of convertibility, it's like stating the problems of Brazil would disappear if the capital market would have uh, stayed open. I'm doubtful both about India and Brazil, but uh, I may be wrong. Thank you.